Good evening and welcome to the Journey Home program. My name is Marcus Grodi and again it's EWTN has given me this great privilege of introducing to you men and women who because of their great love for Jesus Christ were drawn home to the Catholic Church. Our guest this evening is Monsignor Stuart Swetland. Excuse me for getting these glasses out. Now, he's got a long list of titles and it's important that you hear these. He's the chaplain at St. John's Catholic Chapel, director of the Newman Foundation at the University of Illinois, the director of campus ministry at the Diocese of Peoria, and Episcopal Vicar for Social Justice in the Diocese of Peoria. Uh, he's here to share his journey of faith into the Catholic Church, but also to talk about his own call to the vocation of priesthood. And he's very active there in the Newman Center at the University of Illinois, and so you may have some questions about that work. But remember, you're an important part of this program, so let me give you the phone number. It's 1-800-221-9460. Or if you're outside North America, you can give us a call at 205-271-2980. Or you can send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Monsignor Swetland, welcome to the Journey Home. It's great to finally get you here. Kenneth Howell, a good buddy of mine, has been encouraging us to have you on the program for a long time. So it's great to finally... You now, you've been on other EWTN programs, right? Yes, I've had the opportunity to be on EWTN Live twice and a few of the... Uh, St. Charles forums when they were being done in the 90s. All right, well, it's great to have you back, and we might even get you back in the future to talk on some of the issues of social justice, which are so important. During this, it's almost too bad we couldn't have you back immediately <laughs> during, in the midst of this uh, election year to set some uh, things straight as we try and decide what place uh, social justice should play and who we vote for or not vote for. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure, hopefully, we'll get that out in other programming. He does it here at DWT Andrew these coming months. But let me get out of the way and, and begin as I usually do and invite you to share us your spiritual background. If you like. okay. I was uh, born in Pennsylvania. My parents are devout Lutherans and they brought me up in a good Christian home. Uh, we, I was born in Pittsburgh, which I, I, of course, I believe Pennsylvania is God's special country. <laughs> uh, his special teams all play for in Pittsburgh, the Steelers <laughs> and the Pirates. Uh, you can't get that out of me. but. Uh, uh, we moved when I was three years old to uh, the other part of the state, uh, the Pocono Mountains, up in the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area, to a small town called Mohopany, Pennsylvania. And there, there wasn't a Lutheran church. So at different times, as we moved around some of the small towns in that part of the country, uh, we were Methodist and Baptist because my parents were always looking for the church that best proclaimed the Word of God. They were uh, evangelical in their understanding of the Scriptures. They believe it's God's Word. And they instilled in my, my sister, my brother, and myself that love for sacred scripture. As a young boy, I, I think I really discovered Jesus Christ uh, as a boy could. Uh, I remember at five and six, if you'd asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up, I would have said a minister uh, for that period of time. And of course, later I went on to a policeman and astronaut, all the things that <laughs> right. little boys do. And I, again, when we were in a Baptist church when I was 12, I remember having a profound, you know, teenage experience of Jesus. And, and we prayed and I prayed. And, I had a great relationship, and finally, by the time we were about 13 or 14, I was about 13 or 14, uh, a Lutheran church was forming in the town we lived in, and we became sort of founding members, along with some other families, of a wonderful community, St. Paul's Lutheran Church, a Missouri Senate Lutheran Church. And there I, I got a deeper appreciation of Christ and, and the idea of service. I remember my parents teaching me and my pastor, mm -hmm. unto whom much is given, much is expected. And so as I grew uh, a little bit older and was looking to go away to college, the idea of service was an important part of that. And, and so I applied to the Naval Academy um, at the time and was fortunate enough to get accepted after uh, some difficulty. But I finally got accepted and um, uh, my little Lutheran church was very excited about that. It actually gave me a blessing and it was news for the local uh, community of Lutherans. And I went away to Annapolis, uh, a fairly devout Christian. Uh, when I got there, I tried to practice my faith. Uh, they had just ended mandatory chapel a few years before I got to the academy in 77. And so we were allowed to go out in town for church. And though I like going to the Protestant chapel on base, it was kind of nice to get out on Sundays, especially as a freshman, a plebe as we were called. You weren't allowed to go out in town much. So I started going and looking for a Lutheran church there. And what I found when I went out in town was that the Lutheran church in Annapolis was quite, quite different than my little community in Tunkhannock, Pennsylvania. Uh, matter of fact, their teachings were uh, in some extent, 180 degrees opposed to what I've been brought up to believe uh, to be true. Especially they were anti-people uh, serving in the military. They had been what, what was called this one community I was going to, 
was what they called a peace church. And they made it very clear that if I was going to wear my uniform, I really wasn't welcome oh, really? to come to, oh. the, to that church. Oh. Now, of course, I had to wear my uniform as a plea for the Naval Academy. So for all practical purposes, they were saying, you know, don't call us, we'll call you. Uh, and I, I found that very disconcerting that people who say they believe the same scriptures could disagree about something so essential as the appropriateness of serving one's nation in the military or not. Um, I did look for some other communities, but I, as an 18-year-old, it became a great excuse not to practice Christianity, to say, oh, if they can't even get that right, what do they know? And I had that little rebellion that many people had. Um, I, for the next four or five years, for all practical purposes, I was not a practicing Christian. Had you actually just uh, set it aside as a category in your thinking or just out of your practice? Well, it was more out of practice. Uh, I was a little bit intellectually sloppy about it then, which is funny. I was, I was a physics major at the Naval Academy. I took the pursuit of truth very seriously when it came to my science, but I had bracketed that part. And it wasn't that I really disbelieved, but it was that I couldn't figure out how uh, the scriptures could be the sole place for truth, and people interpreting these scriptures could be so different. Yeah. Matter of fact, in my, in my initial search for another community, I went to a church that seemed to be very evangelical, but it turned out that they didn't even believe in the Trinity, that they uh, were, had, had embraced what I now know from theology was the heresy of Sabellianism, that there was one God under three different names, Father, Son, and Spirit, but there was not a Trinity. Uh, and I said, well, look, they can't even get the Trinity right, but yet they had the same scriptures. Yeah. And so it wasn't as much that I had rejected the truth of Christianity as I had uh, found that this uh, this uh, surprising diversity of opinion among churches using the same scriptures seemed to me to be an intellectual problem that I couldn't and didn't want to solve. And I'm wondering also given your emphasis on science during that time, mm -hmm. I remember my own emphasis on science in college, mm -hmm. that often those teachers, at least subtly behind, want to be able to show that there's this one all-encompassing theorem mm -hmm. that can Pull, pull everything together without God in the mm -hmm. equation. I don't know, was that an influence during that time? Or? Actually, there was some good, there were some uh, outstanding Christians in the physics department at the Naval Academy who never preached in the classroom, of course, but m made it clear by the way they lived their lives that they had integrated uh -huh. science right. and faith. Um, I remember visiting with one of them in his, in his home and talking about that at the time, but even that didn't spur me on. Oh, when I went home, I would go to church, and uh, at times I would on special occasions. But I really wasn't practicing the faith in the sense of praying to the Lord and living in a love relationship with the Lord. All right. Now, did you go right from the academy into the Navy? Or? I had a little bit of time in the Navy, but I was fortunate enough at the end of my uh, four years in the Naval Academy to win a, a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford. And it was God's work, really, because <laughs> uh, there hadn't been a Rhodes Scholar from the academy for a long time, and I think he worked overtime to get me there because it was only at Oxford that I would have taken the time to engage the questions of faith. I went away to Oxford in October of, of uh, 81, and one of the first books that I was given uh, to read, uh, actually two books, uh, Descartes' uh, philosophy, Rene Descartes, The Meditations and the Discourse, which talk about his, his philosophical method, which, of course, the Oxford uh, uh, philosophers believed in this approach uh, uh, a great deal. That's why it was the first book. And Descartes says you should challenge everything you believe, that the, he puts everything under the crucible of doubt even to the point where he says, maybe I'm asleep, maybe I, I'm not really awake, maybe everything I see is an illusion, maybe I'm dreaming. And of course, that leads Descartes to the famous Codico Ergo Sum, you know, I think, therefore I am, uh, which he then builds his philosophy on. But what I took from it, sort of reading the philosophy almost like an evangelical, was to literally, I should do this, I should put everything in my life under the test and under the crucible of doubt to figure out what I believe and why I believe it. Well, one of the areas I had to face was the question of faith. So I started to say, well, what do I believe and why do I believe it? Yeah. And that's when I turned back to look at the Christian text, but now with a, 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 very, um, a very heavy mindset of doubt. Mm. And I started to look at these texts like they were just like any other ancient uh, text. I was reading at the time some Caesar, uh, uh, some Thucydides for the military purposes. And so I read them like I was reading Julius Caesar. Mm. But as I read, I realized with the help of some, uh, some guidance that um, there are cr truth claims in the scriptures. And one of the truth cra claims that was absolutely essential to these, these texts was the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified and died, but that his followers said he was raised up. 
And so I started to read and said, well, let's look at this as if I didn't believe anything. <laughs> is that evidence true? And I came to recognize that as you read these documents, the claims for the resurrection of Christ are very strong. Paul talks about 500 people, most of whom are still alive, as he writes in 1 Corinthians 15, saw the risen Lord. And you see the change in the lives of the men and women who encountered the resurrected Lord. Most of them went to their death, yeah. believing and willing to die for the one fact that they had encountered the resurrected Lord. So at looking at this, I said, it, 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 this, is, this seems true. Could it be true? And then I began to pray again. And I realized it is true. And I had to return to the Christian faith of my childhood. Um. I'm wondering, during this whole time, had your parents been aware of your drifting? I think I might, have, I might have hid it from them fairly oh, well, okay. as teenagers have a tendency to do, because <laughs> uh, I went to church with them at times. But I think they knew, there were several times I would not go to communion in the yeah. Lutheran church. And I think, though they, they, they never pushed, they, uh, they wondered what was going on. And it uh, leads me to ask, now that you've had this rediscovery at that point in time of the validity of the faith based on the reality of the resurrection, did they also catch that, that boy, there's something has changed here in his life? Well, since I was overseas, they didn't oh, okay. see me there as often, but I think, uh, I mean, I think they were excited that I was again excited about the faith. All right. I know they were praying very hard for me during that period of time and giving witness of being good Christian you know, parents. Um, and uh, so there's, the rediscovery of Christianity for me was so exciting. Right. Uh, I went to, of course, did what I would, would do. I looked for an evangelical type of church, and in Oxford there was an Anglican church that was uh, an evangelical, uh, Canon Green, who was a famous preacher yeah. in, in England, sort of the Billy Graham oh, of, of England, of uh, was the re uh, rector there. And, Michael uh, Green, right? Michael Green, yes, right, yeah. St. Aldate's yeah. in uh, yeah. Oxford. And so I went there, and I joined a Bible study. I did all the things that uh, I should do as a good Christian young man. But after a few months, uh, I realized they were preaching the curriculum, the basic message of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection. They were calling people to Christian belief, and, and I had rediscovered that and said yes. Yeah. But there wasn't a certain fullness yeah. that, that I was looking for. And uh, I, uh, I started to look at the scriptures now and said, where can I find that fullness? Yeah. Uh, I noticed, for example, in James that it talks about anointing the sick, but yet in, in that tradition they didn't anoint the sick. Yeah. Um, and it talked in, in John about the apostles forgiving sins. The sins you forgive are forgiven. The sins you help bomb are held bomb. But yet that wasn't something that I saw done in any, in any integral way. And so I started searching, where, where can we find uh, somewhere that uh, the fullness of these teachings are lived out? But the other question that still was there was, well, different Christians interpret these yeah. texts differently. See, I was going to say that, that, that that branch of evangelical Christianity which you had been drawn into there is a wonderful branch mm -hmm. and it was I say that also because I was a part of that my own uh, seminary was very keyed into uh, you know um, uh, I'm trying to think of the other great writers that really fed InterVarsity Press that whole InterVarsity mm -hmm. movement um, and G.I. Packer mm -hmm. that whole group uh, which were solid but when you stood back and looked at that same group they weren't all of the same tradition they were evangelicals, mm -hmm. but some were of an Anglican, mm -hmm. some were of an independent, some were Congregationalists. Mm -hmm. And so what happens, and I maybe reflect on this as you were talking about, the, is that it takes those issues like the ecclesiology, sacraments, mm -hmm. ordination, and really makes it very thin. Mm -hmm. It focuses on Jesus and the resurrection and new life, but the importance of church, the importance of sacraments, mm -hmm. the importance of those issues become very thin and often left aside because there was this disunity amongst the same believers in the same group of folk. Right, right. And of course, uh, something that was absolutely vital for me is I had fallen in with a group of friends who are wonderful, good friends. Uh, there was seven of us total, and, and four of those seven, just by coincidence, God's coincidence, uh, <laughs> were good, faithful Catholics who were living their faith. And we discussed everything. So they, would, they were living their faith and giving a wonderful witness. Uh, and they had a peace and joy that I uh, admired and wanted to, to uh, participate in. And they started to point me in directions, well, read this, look at that. And at the same time, I found as I was studying my philosophy that there were uh, wonderful answers to the questions that my dons, as they called them, their yeah. professors, had set me to answer in Catholic philosophers, you know, Catholic thinkers and Catholic writers. 
Uh, at first, i be honest with you, I was an anti-Catholic bigot at this stage. I mean, I, I looked at everything the Catholic Church taught as a suspect just because it was yeah. Catholic. But as I read people like Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine and, and some of the more modern followers of those traditions, uh, uh, the 150th anniversary of the Oxford movement happened while I was at Oxford. And wow. So there was a lot of discussion yeah. of that movement and, of course, John Henry Newman, Cardinal Newman being a big part of that. As I began reading these texts, I said, there's a wisdom here and there's an insight here. And there's also, they have an answer to the question, how do you make sure that the text and its proper interpretation is given to every age? Hmm. That the whole word of God, the whole witness to Christ is handed on to every age faithfully and interpreted correctly for that day and age. It seems to me that if God loves us, he has to have a way for that to happen because he has to get his word to every generation. Uh, the, just the question of war and peace. How are we gonna answer that? Yeah. Well, the Catholic Church believes that the Holy Spirit's been given to the church in a particular way to guard it and guide it in, in answering the questions of faith, what we are to believe, or morals, how we are to live in every age. And that they have the charism through the official teachers of the church, the magisterium, to ensure that those things taught to us are the word of God and are faithful to the tradition that has been received. Now, at this time in your journey, when you're discovering this from your four friends, mm -hmm. were you becoming, therefore, more open to the Catholic Church? I was. Were, were I you fighting against them? <laughs> Un unbeknownst to them, secretly, uh, uh, probably for fear like Nicodemus, uh, <laughs> I was going to see a Catholic priest just to learn about the Catholic Church. Uh, he was kind enough to uh, meet me one-on-one. One -on -one. Uh, every, every week we were in term, uh, we'd come and have tea about 4 o'clock and sit there, and we would just <laughs> discuss... Uh, what, I ha what questions I had, and he was very faithful, very patient, very kind. Uh, Father Rod Strange, who's now in Rome as the head of the uh, Beta College, um, he, um, he was kind to, to answer the questions and help open, open, my, open me up to, to seeing things in a Catholic way. At what point in there, well, first of all, okay, so uh, uh, did you have any particular barriers to jump over as you were considering the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. or did it come fairly smoothly? Uh, the, the, the uh, moral, some of the moral teachings were very difficult for me mm -hmm. to accept. I had accepted a lot of the secular, uh, it was the 70s when we yeah. thought we were, you know, the population bomb. Now everyone's worried about depopulation. <laughs> Back then they were worried about overpopulation. Uh, and it was all the things, the sexual ethic was very difficult for me to understand. And, and some of the social teachings were, uh, I was sort of a conservative Reagan Republican. And some of the, the calls to the preference option for the poor and to be more concerned with those on the margins of society seemed a bit challenging to my economic mind. It said, talked about efficiency and things like that. Uh, and I started looking at all those issues, but I had a very good friend who's now a, a professor at Seton Hall. He's an uh, Irishman, Dermot Quinn. And Dermot was a classmate of mine. He was doing his doctoral work there. And at the time, he saw that I was studying all these issues. And he said to me, Stuart, you can study from now until the day you die everything the church teaches. And you may actually get to the point where you agree with everything the church teaches it won't make you Catholic. He said, the one thing that will make you Catholic is you, if for you to believe that the Catholic Church is who she says she is. He said, if the Church is who she says she is, and she says she is the Church founded by Jesus Christ with everything God intended for our sanctification and salvation, if you believe that, you must become Catholic. Hmm. If that truth is not something you can believe, then you can never become Catholic because it would be wrong because then the church wouldn't be yeah. what she says she is. And that really was like a lightning bolt to me because I realized it wasn't about agreeing with all the church teachings of the church. It was believing the church is who she says she is. Yeah. And then if that's true, then her teachings are true. Yeah. And then I can have the faith-seeking understanding. I, I can you know, believe and then seek to understand these truths as revelation from God. So how long did it take you to deal with three that issue? Three years. <laughs> <laughs> Best part of three years. I was three years at Oxford, and I came into the church right before I left, uh, Easter, uh, in the Easter Vigil of 1984. Did Newman's books have an influence on your final decision? Uh, not as much as they should have. I, I only came to a systematic read of Newman after I was Catholic. Uh, they helped solidify yeah. my uh, Catholic sensibility about things. Uh, but some of his writings uh, did, and some of his essays did help yeah. in, the, in the conversion. So at what point, so you're, you finally, after three years, are open to the truth of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and it is interesting that it was the social teachings that were a bar barrier for you, but mm -hmm. now that's one of the main things you focus on in mm -hmm. your teaching. But uh, at what point in there did you uh, hear the vocational call to the priesthood? 
Well, I, it's, as I mentioned, when, if you had asked me at four or five or six, I might have said I, I want to be a minister when I grow up. But um, what, I, what I found uh, uh, as I was praying again and as I was studying the scriptures, I, I felt this call come back. And I went to Father Strange and said, you know, I've got this strange thing. I may be called to be a priest. And he said, that could well be. And he said, it all could also well be the zeal of the convert. <laughs> he said, wait. He said, if three years from now you still feel the same way, then you have to do something about it. But uh, if, if, give it three years. And that was very, very uh, uh, sound advice, good spiritual advice. I spent three years as a lay, layman, in the, and, and I had three years of commitment to the Navy anyhow. Yeah. And so I went back and served in the Navy. And it was during that time as a, as a naval officer that my call uh, actually deepened. Mm -hmm. And by the end of, of my initial commitment to the military, it was pretty certain in my mind uh, that God was calling me to be a priest, or at least I had to go and, and try that out. Mm -hmm. Talk about your work then at the uh, University of Illinois. Uh, I've been very uh, blessed as a convert, a Newman Center convert, to spend most of my priesthood working at Newman Centers. <laughs> I was at Bradley University uh, in early in my priesthood, and then after doing my doctoral work, um, I came back to the University of Illinois, where there's a wonderful Newman Foundation. Mm -hmm. My predecessor, uh, Monsignor Ed Duncan, and before him, John O'Brien, the famous apologist. That's right. uh, they, they were the only two real Newman chaplains there had been before myself at the university, and they built up a wonderful foundation, uh, a wonderful uh, ministry. Uh, we have, uh, at any given weekend, we have uh, over 2,000 young men and women come to Mass. Uh, we have uh, 200 people going to daily Mass mm -hmm. at, the, uh, at the university. Uh, we have 346 students that live at uh, our Newman Foundation. We, we provide dormitories. Uh, we have Bible studies and, and all kinds of, of activities for people uh, to deepen their relationship with the Lord. Because when a student comes up from high school to the university, and 85% of our Catholic youth are going to secular, non-Catholic universities, uh, they have a faith they've inherited from their parents. But during that period of time they're in college, they've got to make it their own mm -hmm. as an adult. And it's a wonderful time to be with students, to journey with them, to accompany them on this journey, uh, on this pilgrimage. But it's also a, a precious time, but it's, a, it's also a dangerous time because there's a lot of other temptations that try to draw away from Christ and his church. So it's, it's fantastic to be able to be with them and guide them. And you mentioned me earlier that you had seen a fair number of converts. It, it's an exciting phenomenon going on. I mean, it's one of those great things that give us hope in the church. Uh, in the last uh, six, seven years I've been at the, at the Newman Foundation, the smallest RCA we've had is 35 people, and we've had as high as 55 people. Many of them are outright baptisms. This past year we had 38 converts for Easter Vigil, and 20 of them were baptized. Uh, and what we're seeing is a, a people who are coming to the faith and they love what the church is teaching, especially they see it in the person and in the teachings of John Paul II. He really is the Pope for the young. Well, thank you very much, Father, for thank sharing. You. A uh, nice summary. It's hard to take someone's whole life and bring it down to, into our time period, but thank you very much. Let's take a break. We'll come back in just a moment with your questions for Monsignor Stuart Swetman. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. Our guest tonight is uh, Monsignor Stuart Swetland, and again, thank you for sharing, uh, you know, a quick summary of your journey. And mm -hmm. also, it's good for the audience to know that uh, at, at even at state universities, there are great Catholic witnesses mm -hmm. there, and uh, it's good to hear that because often, as you mentioned, a, a large percentage of Catholic families can't necessarily afford to send their children to the private schools, mm -hmm. and so they go to the Catholic universities. I mean, what's the key there? Let's say a families children have to go to a state university or a non-Catholic mm -hmm. university, what's the key that they ought to look forward to to help their children have a strong 
continue a strong faith. Well, I would visit the university and make sure they have a good active ministry to university students or there's a parish close by that could, um, you know, feed their students intellectually and spiritually. Uh, I think it's important that that age group has a parish that's orientated towards them. At the Newman Foundation, we're, we're in a situation where uh, the young people can do almost everything. Mm -hmm. uh, we have everything from masters of ceremonies uh, to uh, our readers and lectors. That helps give the atmosphere that this is going to be orientated towards this age group with these problems, their issues. Uh, and what you want is a good, faithful uh, Newman Foundation who is willing to present the whole truth, the whole Catholic teaching, uh, uh, in season and out of season at that university. Uh, and because all the ideas are going to be presented at a university that's, that's a good university. And I believe Catholicism can hold up with any because I believe the truth has its own power to convince. So if a, if a foundation or a Newman ministry or a Newman club is there presenting the truth whole and entire, you know, preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified and all the teachings of the church, that's going to be a place where a student can be grounded intellectually and spiritually. And I don't want to point any fingers, but that's not always the case. Sadly, it hasn't been. And sometimes our Newman Foundation... You see an improvement? Oh, a great deal of improvement. Great. Sometimes our Newman uh, uh, clubs thought that that was the best place to experiment. And the last thing you want to do with an <laughs> age group of 18 to 22 or 18 to 25 is do a lot of experimentation. They need meat, meat and potatoes grounding in their faith so that they can go forward in their vocation. And sometimes it was done in the name of Newman as if that he would have approved mm -hmm. some of these ex progressive experiments, which would have been the last thing that Newman, I think, would have been open to. Clearly, <laughs> in his idea of a university, he, he lays out the kind, of th the kind of ministry that should be done. All right. Thank you, Father. Let's take our first caller, Don from Minnesota. Hello, Don. What's your question for us? Yes. Hi. Uh, I had a, a couple of questions. That's all right. The first question, there's a preacher in Minnesota who's Lutheran, and he claims that the Catholics don't even know that they're saved. And being that I'm on a cusp of becoming a Catholic, uh, I know nothing of the faith, but I'm on a cusp of learning what it really means, and again, grasping what it means to, to really grab the meat of the faith. And uh, I've, I've, I'm, for the first time, 47 years old, learning what it means to surrender my life to Christ. Yep. And it's not about me, it's about His will. Yep. And also, the other question I have, being that I came from a very abusive environment, and Jesus Christ wasn't even mentioned in my house, and... Uh, and uh, of a loose morals, so to speak, and uh, I, unfortunately I've had three different children from three different women, and so for the last 14 years I've abstained, and I've repented from that, I feel, and I don't plan on ever doing anything like that again unless I first marry and do it the Lord's way, because I tried it my way and it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the question I ask, does this also mean I can't take communion as a result of this? Now, these are two questions that I have, and you'd be as kind as to answer them. Don, God thank, bless you both. thank you so much for calling, and uh, you know, God bless you, because the Lord is truly working in your life, uh, and I'm glad you asked the questions. Yes. Well, first, I would like to, I, I would say, Catholics know that they have a love relationship with Jesus Christ. They know the risen Lord. When people talk about salvation, they often treat it as if it's something magical, rather than what it really is, is a lived out love relationship with the Lord that begins now and is fulfilled in heaven. Now Catholics won't say, because we believe it's presumptuous, to say we're assured of our salvation because that would presume that we're going to be faithful to the end. We still have free will and we could abandon Christ. Hopefully we love Him enough that we're not going to do that. We have the sources of graces that we aren't. So we don't like to say that we are sure of our salvation. I think the best answer was given by St. Joan of Arc when she was quizzed about if she knew she was saved. She said, if I'm not in the state of grace, I pray the Lord place me there. If I am in the state of grace, I pray the Lord keep me there. And that's how Catholics pray. As far as the second question, having repented of the sins you mentioned, having uh, given to the Lord your life, when you are received into full communion with the church, you will be able to receive communion because Christ's grace heals those sins of your past. And we pray that that will be soon because the most joyous day of my life was the first day I could receive the Lord in the Eucharist. <laughs> I mean, the, the beauty of the box of coming into the confessional, mm -hmm. you know, is really a great gift that's, in some ways I try and, it's like when you try and tell someone what it means to be a, a, to run 10 miles mm -hmm. when they can hardly run one. There's mm -hmm. something called a second wind. There's a, there's a part about the, what your body goes through. And I think there's something about the confessional in the sacraments mm -hmm. that it's hard to explain to people that have never experienced the graces of the sacrament. It's, it's, it's such a wonderful sacrament. Uh, I, uh, I love Chesterton's description of, of going to confession in London. 
and then walking out of the confessional and seeing London for the, for the, for the first time <laughs> because he was a new soul. Yeah. And Augustine says that uh, the act of recreation that goes on in the confessional when the soul is made anew is greater than the act of the creation of that soul. Mm -hmm. And I think in a way that is, 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 right, is spot on, as the English would put it. We may not always feel it, but we have to claim it and recognize mm -hmm. the reality of that. It's, it, it's so beautiful to, to be, actually, uh, be able to actually hear the words spoken to the priest when I go to confession. I try to go every week, and I hear the priest say, I forgive you. You know, in the name of Christ, he, and, and I know my sins are forgiven because I have uh, received that encounter, which is taking, taking me seriously as a bodily, physical person. In fact, the book I read recently by Sheen, he talks about the, uh, the often he believes that a large percentage of the psychological problems experienced in our culture mm -hmm. is because people are holding on to this guilt, mm -hmm. which they have no way to get rid of because mm -hmm. they don't avow themselves mm -hmm. of the, you know, the great release that comes in the sacrament of confession. I once read a secular uh, psychologist who was not a believer who said that most of his patients could be cured with one good confession. He at least admired the church that much. He said the confessional replaces the couch uh, for a lot of people. All right, thank you, Father. Let's take our first email. This comes from Tim. Dear Monsignor Swetland, thank you for your witness. Do you ever see yourself one day getting involved with military chaplaincy mm -hmm. because of your Navy experience? I know they're looking for good men of God and our Lord like yourself. As an mm -hmm. aside, what about our Mother Mary? How did you overcome any of your prior misconceptions of how we Catholics venerate or love her? Thank you, Tim, for your email. Yeah. Uh, well, in the first question, I uh, offered to my bishop when I was ordained uh, the, the possibility of going back to uh, the military. I left that up, decision up to, to him. Uh, at that time and continually, uh, continuing to this day, the, our diocese has, has uh, given its fair share of, of men to the military, which is extremely important, yeah. apostolate. Uh, I have taken the occasion of a couple of uh, vacations to, to, to go and, and serve at military bases. I did that right after 9-11. For that Christmas, I was invited to go to Japan and was able to serve at an Air Force base for three weeks. And uh, recently, I've done some things at the Air Force Academy, uh, teaching on war and peace and a few other ethics of war and peace. So I think it's very important, and we need good uh, chaplains in the military. Uh, and if my bishop tomorrow says it's time to go, wonderful, I would go. <laughs> but that's his decision, not mine. Yeah. As far as the, uh, uh, the second question, uh, I did not have the, the kind of opposition that many uh, Protestants becoming Catholic have to Mary. Uh, once I understood what the church was, I saw the church's teaching on Mary to be consistent with Scripture. The way that, that the Scriptures speak about Mary and the way she's there with the church as the mother of the church uh, is the way that, the, the, uh, that I experienced her. And, and then when I looked at uh, uh, the book of Revelation and saw uh, the way that the angels and saints intercede for us, it was not a problem to ask her to intercede, as I would ask you or the audience to pray uh, for, for me. Uh, one thing I did, I developed after I became Catholic, was a great uh, friendship with Mary and, the, and some other saints. And that's one of the great things about our faith. We can be companions and friends to all the friends of Jesus who have lived through space and time and develop real intimate friendships with them. I know that we have uh, a fair number of Canadian viewers now that we are seeing more mm -hmm. readily in Canada. And one thing I've discovered as I've been s preparing for our, our trip coming up, we're mm -hmm. taking a whole crew uh, to Canada next week to do some filming. Uh, and one thing as I've kind of refreshed my own history in, in the church in Canada was that there was a great devotion of the settlers of Canada to the Holy Family. Mm -hmm. Very, very deep commitment to the Holy Family and an understanding of that. And everywhere you go, there's St. Anne Church, mm -hmm. St. Joseph Parish. And uh, this idea of the friends of Christ, his family of Christ, and this great cloud of witnesses that can intercede for us in the midst of our struggles. And they saw that in their pioneering days as they settled Canada. Let's take our next caller. This is Mary from California. Hello, Mary. What's your question? Uh, yes, Monsignor. Um, I um, and my friend were just back at the Naval Academy um, last a week ago Sunday attending chapel there. It was his 60th reunion, class mm -hmm. of 1945. <laughs> and he graduated in 44 due to the war mm -hmm. breaking out and uh, so um, we had a good turnout and we were attending nine o'clock mass at the chapel and of course the cross was on the altar with the crucifix i mean with the christ on it mm -hmm. the crucifix and then we were um, attending that uh, chapel a little later as a memorial for the fallen um, classmates and it was a protestant service and the cross was replaced with an empty cross 
And um, a friend of mine who's an evangelical reformed uh, Swedish gal from Minnesota said the reason for the difference is um, that the Protestants believe uh, their emphasis is on the resurrection and ours is on the uh, crucifixion. And I just wondered if, if that is really true. Thank you, Mary, for your question. Well, the, um, uh, both are legitimate Christian symbols of our faith. Uh, it's very important to recognize that, that uh, I, of course, love the crucifix. And even before I was Catholic, it's not unusual for Lutherans to have a crucifix as well. As, right. you know, it's, it's something that I grew up in with. In fact, you have a, a Jerusalem cross pin, I think. Right, 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 right. Uh, from, for the Knights of Holy Sepulchre. The, right. um, uh, the symbolism involved isn't the difference between, oh, you were, I, I remember hearing this from Baptists when I was a, uh, at a Baptist church, that you worship a dead God because you have Jesus on the, on the cross, where we worship a resurrected Lord. No, the, obviously the Catholics believe in a resurrected Lord, but it's, it's not the cross that saved us, it's the body on the cross that saved us. Uh, and I, I think that that recognition of that, so it's not one of these either or, it's a both and. Right. We, we, we venerate the, the wood of the cross on, on a, a Good Friday because we recognize that this is the instrument by which our Redeemer was, was crucified but it's our Redeemer that saved us. Yeah. Uh, I do love the military though, uh, when I was at that Air Force Base at Japan, they have behind the altar uh, a, a metal piece that spins, and on one side's a cross, on the other's a crucifix, on the third's a Star of David, <laughs> so that the chapel can serve all three of the great, uh, great uh, religions there. All right, let's uh, take our next email. Kathy from York, Pennsylvania, she writes, Hello, my father's side of the family is Catholic. So I'm familiar with many of the traditions of the church. My mother's side is Lutheran, so that's how I was raised and confirmed. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've always struggled with about Catholicism is the belief in purgatory. Could you give mm -hmm. me some reference to study this from scripture, et cetera? Thank you mm -hmm. for your wonderful program. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, one of the most uh, straightforward references to purgatory is in the book of Maccabees, uh, where, uh, and of course, this is a disputed book between Lutherans and Catholics, where Catholics believe it's inspired scripture, Lutherans do not. And uh, so you know, that's one of the questions really before the questions, but there are some New Testament references. Um, let's see, I wasn't, ex let's see. Uh, for example, in the, uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter three, uh, it talks about uh, the testing of our, of our work. Um, it talks about the foundations. It says, no one can lay a foundation other than the one that has been laid, namely Jesus Christ. If different ones build on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, the work of each will be made clear. The day will disclose it. That day will make it appear, its, its appearance with fire, and fire will test the quality of each man's work. If the building uh, a man has raised on this foundation still stands, he will receive his recompense. If a man's building burns, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one fleeing through fire. This is one of the texts, uh, there are others, but that the church sees that, that the, if you will, the, the quality of our love of the Lord it will be tested, and if it's not perfect, uh, it needs to be perfected. At the end of Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, the first chapter five, it says, you must be perfected as your Father in heaven is perfect. Let me extend that question a bit, because yeah. it's kind of like in the questions of Mary, to really understand why we pray to Mary, we have to back up a bit and talk about the meaning of the communion of saints, mm -hmm. right? That's the foundation for that. Right. Same thing with purgatory. It, we back up a bit and, and understand the Catholic view of sin. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk a bit about that because the Catholic view of sin is often quite a bit different than the mm -hmm. non-Catholic Protestant view of sin. Mm -hmm. In other words, the effect that a sin has right. on us. Right. Well, what a sin does really is, is mutilate us, makes us less than we ought to be. When we choose, when I choose to free, freely choose to do something I, I know not to be God's will, I choose to be less than I could be. And uh, while uh, when I turn, when I convert and say, uh, ask forgiveness for that sin, uh, the Lord takes care of the, the, the uh, eternal punishment that would be rightfully earned from that uh, turning away from him. But there still is the temporal reality in my body, uh, in, my, in my existence in space and time that is made less because I chose that. Uh, if, if it's something I frequently chose, I build up a habit that we would call a vice. Yeah. Uh, and that needs to be perfected. Now, God's grace will do that if I let him. But sometimes it's like a, I use the metaphor of my students of, of straightening teeth. I had uh, uh, orthodontics work done in the 30s, my 30s. So, I mean, it took a long time to move those teeth back into being straight because they had grown crooked for many years. 
Uh, you couldn't do it all at once or you'd break them. So it had to be slow, steady pressure. Well, God's grace is that way. It penetrates and possesses us and perfects us if we let it. So there is the temporal reality due to sin that needs to be dealt with. Sometimes we die not yet perfected by God's grace and we need that period of time or however we look at it, that, that period when we are perfected. I call it the finishing school of love uh, in the life to come. Well, I know that Luther was, uh, as he was redefining this faith alone and total depravity and trying to come up with his, the new formulation mm -hmm. that at some point in there he talks about, you know, a pile of dung being covered with white snow mm -hmm. as if when we stand before God at the end, he doesn't see our impurity. All he sees is the, is the purity of Christ's mm -hmm. righteousness. Mm -hmm. But the, of course, the, the, the problem with that is it doesn't deal mm -hmm. with what we really are. Right. So does that mean, therefore, we enter into heaven with all that impurity and God is always blind to it? Or at some point we are purged? Right. Well, that's called purgatory. <laughs> right. right, and that's such an important teaching because uh, it's a very optimistic view of the human person that we can be perfected, that God's grace can penetrate and possess. Lutherans and Catholics have come a long way in understanding that we mean the same thing yep. uh, about sanctifying grace. But one area we still disagree about is how much that grace perfects the human person. Does it really change us at the core of, of our being to perfect us, to make us the other Christ so that we can say, like Paul says in his letter to the Galatians, I live, no longer I, but Christ within yeah, me. Yeah. In fact, I love that verse in 2 Corinthians, anyone who is in Christ is a, a new, new creation. creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And it gets us to the theology of what it means to be in Christ. Mm -hmm. you know, at any one time, to what extent are we in Christ? You know, are we can we out doing whatever we want to do and still be in Christ? Mm -hmm. Or can we turn away from that? And that's again where our theologies differ between Lutheran and Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, can we actually lose that by turning away? Let's go with our next caller, Cecilia from New Jersey. Hello, Cecilia. What's your question? Oh, good evening. I would like to ask Monsignor, what book or books would you recommend for a college student who's a cradle Catholic but not well informed about the faith and drifting away. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll hang up and I'll listen to the answer. So, so a great question. Thank you very okay. much. If they're a reader, I think Carl Adams' book, The Spirit of Catholicism, oh, is a classic that everyone should read. Uh, Tom, uh, Thomas Howard's uh, yeah. uh, book on Catholicism as well um, is an excellent one. I notice that a lot of my students enjoy uh, Scott Hahn's uh, uh, Rome Sweet Home mm -hmm. um, uh, as, as a book that they find uh, helpful. Uh, those would be three right off, off the back. Of course, the catechism itself is so rich, yeah. but it's not told as a story. Yeah. Uh, it, it just has it's a, it, more of a compendium of the faith. Uh, so these books have more, if you will, the story that lays it out. If they're really, a, 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 if they like English literature, I found G.K. Chesterton's Orthodoxy to be a wonderful uh, book, but not every student nowadays yeah. likes, likes that book. Yeah, that could be a bit challenging. There's an, uh, I will also recommend as a quick little summary, you've got um, Catholic Answers, little pillar of fire, pillar of truth, for a real short, little succinct. Yes, that would be if you if you want something more on, on the, if you will, the pamphlet level. That is that is by far the best short summary. Yeah. Okay. Let's take this next email. This comes from uh, Emil in uh, New Jersey. Uh, hello, Marcus and Father Swetland. Thank you for your show and for Monsignor's witness. My question is, how can I, a Catholic, help another Christian, Catholic or non-Catholic? understand that the church was truly established by Jesus. Mm -hmm. I agree with Father Swetland, this may be a key point into accepting the teachings mm -hmm. of the Catholic Church. Thank you, Emil. Yeah. Uh, well, first, I think the, the witness of the church, uh, alive today, has to be the, the thing that draws people the most. Uh, J John Paul II has said this on occasions, that the biggest obstacle to evangelization is Catholics. You know, if we <laughs> lived our faith, if our communities lived the faith the way we should, it would be so evident that this is the church founded by Christ with all the things that Christ intended the church to have. But if you look at it intellectually, one of the things I discovered as I looked closely at the scriptures was that Jesus didn't come to save individuals. He didn't come to write a book. He came to form a community of persons in friendship with God. And it's from that community of persons that we get the witness of sacred scripture, the New Testament. We get from that community of persons that witness to the life and teaching of Christ. And of course, that community of persons made up of people who have come to know and convert mm -hmm. to Christ. But the key is that Christ, if you look, he didn't try to, to, uh, to write a book. As far as we know, he wrote only on the ground and that got wiped out in, with history. But uh, he came to form a community and the community gives us everything else. All right. 
and, there's, and there's so many places even when he talks in the plural like mm -hmm. when he gives us the our the prayer mm -hmm. of our family the our right. father it isn't uh, my, not father, my father it's our father you know give yeah. me me the bread i need it's right. our it's community right and i would also if you look at the acts the apostles just the way the early church responded to christ the way they saw themselves they gathered as a community they shared the apostolic teaching the breaking of bread they they shared their goods they were a community and you can see that that's how they thought of themselves, mm -hmm. to be stay faithful to the witness of the apostles and their witness to Christ, to come together to break bread, to celebrate the Eucharist. How important was the early fathers to you in your journey? It was, it was an important witness. As I read people like Justin Martyr, Ignatius of Antioch, I mean, an early, you're talking about right at the end <laughs> of the first century, and here's a man talking about all the things that the Catholic Church has, bishops, the Eucharist. I mean, uh, it, it was such a powerful witness uh, that as I looked to who is authentically living the fullness of Christianity. As I read the early church fathers, I realized that what they were witnessing to, as Acts the Apostles uh, witness, was to the Catholic Church. All right, thank you, Father. Let's take our next caller, Stan from South Carolina. Hello, Stan, what's your question? My question is, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, taking this call. Sure, Stan. Just a minute. Uh, what I'd like to know, uh, Father mentioned his parents earlier in the program mm -hmm. and when did he inform them that he was going to be a Catholic mm -hmm. and how did they accept it or how or when you know what their reaction was to his conversion to the Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Thank you Stan. Yeah. My parents are saints in my opinion and uh, <laughs> I informed them when I was home uh, from Oxford uh, close to the time I was coming to the church at Christmas before and it was not a pleasant <laughs> conversation <laughs> because they didn't agree of course. Um, my sister had become Catholic before I did oh, really? to marry into a, a Catholic. Uh, he, she married a, a Catholic man, a wonderful man. Uh, he's Polish American and a very strong Catholic tradition there in uh, that, that nationality. So uh, she had sort of paved the way. And there was a great deal of resistance and even more resistance when I said I was leaving the military to become a priest. But what we found as a family together as we live, you know, these many years now, with my sister and I being Catholic and my mom and dad being Lutheran, is that we've learned how to be really an ecumenical family. Yeah. And what I mean by that is we are all dedicated to Christ and we want to emphasize what we share, which is much more than what divides us. Yeah. And so we pray together, we worship together. When I'm home, I often go to the Lutheran church with them. They love to attend mass uh, when I celebrate it or, or to come with me when I can celebrate. Uh, and we've learned to, to appreciate each other's traditions but we're also very honest about where we disagree. We don't paper it over and we don't. So my parents will attend Mass, but they wouldn't receive communion, and I won't receive communion in Lutheran Church because honestly, we're not in full communion that way. We pray for the day when we are, but we're not there. So my parents, uh, we've, if you will, had a cross-pollinization where um, uh, I have a lot of the type of prayer I did as a child, I still do with scripture and, and in my uh, Lutheran upbringing. Uh, the kind of prayer that I do now, my parents have learned to love. My mom prays the rosary, for example, and reminds me that Luther had a devotion to Our Lady. That's right. All right, thank you, Father. Let's take a break. We'll be back in just a moment with some final words for the journey home. Father, uh, during the break, we uh, I was informed we had a viewer that was wondering how many vocations have come out of the, the work there at the University of Illinois. Well, I assume by the question they mean uh, priestly vocations, yep. though, uh, of course, one of the things I, <laughs> I preach a lot about is everyone has a vocation right. and finding it. We've had some wonderful marriages and people finding and discovering what God's calling them to. But as far as priestly vocations, I just heard of another one uh, today on my way here. A vocation director called me, and if that person goes in, he'll be number 49 in the last wow. seven years. 49, yeah. that's like 70 a year. I mean, yeah, that's about great. 70 a year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's really great. Yeah. And uh, I mean, in a way, that means that by just helping strengthen their faith in Christ, then the Spirit can work in their heart to hear it. It isn't so much you 
you know, grabbing them by the collar, it's letting the Spirit work in their life. Right, exactly. We want people to find their vocation and fulfill it, whatever it is, because that's what they were made for. And if we preach and teach that, enough men and women are going to find their vocation to the religious life and priesthood because God's calling. And it's just a matter of everyone listening to find their call. You described your early journey uh, really as more of an evangelical journey through these different denominational influences, mm -hmm. though the main was Lutheran. Talk a bit in conclusion on how becoming Catholic has deepened and strengthened your faith in Christ. Well, in the church, I become enthralled with Jesus. And what I've realized is Jesus is enthralled with me. That's an amazing that uh, lump of clay that I am, that Jesus would <laughs> love me with such passion and such uh, mercy. But yet he does, and I've been able to respond to that, especially in the Eucharist, the vulnerability, the way he gives himself to us and allows us to really receive him. Teresa of Avila, one of my favorite saints, talked about receiving communion being akin to the marital act. You become one flesh. And because the bridegroom, Christ, loves us, the church, the bride, with such love that he gives himself the way that a bridegroom does to his bride. And Christ gives himself to us each day. And I've been able to participate in that and deepen uh, my love for him and respond to his love for me, which is infinite. You mentioned earlier when we had a question mm -hmm. about uh, eternal security and mm -hmm. how as Catholics we can, we recognize the fact that we can abandon Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and we even see in scripture the emphasis that if you, you, know, if you remain with me, mm -hmm. you know, if you hold tight to the truth, but as you just mentioned, the one thing we do completely recognize as Catholics is that Christ will never abandon us. That's correct. And, and the beautiful thing is that gives us such great confidence. Yeah. And now from that stance, that, that rock, that solid rock, we can go forward. Our minds being fed by the truth, our spirit being fed by the, by the sacraments and his love, and even our, our hearts being uh, uplifted by the beauty of it all, the beauty of art, the beauty of his creation. And it's from all of that that we get to see the grandeur and the glory of God. Of course, you've been given that great privilege of being able to be a priest and be the channel of those sacramental graces to so many people. And Unworthy that I am, it is an amazing mystery. Well, could I uh, uh, delve into that a little bit and ask you to uh, give us a blessing, Father, as we end the, end the program today? Most certainly. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his kindness and grant you his salvation. And may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you. For your fine witness and also God's blessing on your work at the Newman Center and all the other <laughs> responsibilities that you have there in your diocese. And I would like to ask the audience uh, to, to pray for us next week as we're in Canada filming, visiting uh, with uh, also the Cardinal in Quebec. We'll be spending a couple days in Quebec and then in Montreal. We'll be up in uh, uh, St. Anne of a variety of shrines in Canada. Please pray for us on our trip. And then I look forward to being with you again in a couple weeks. God bless.